Um, my name is Eliza Ennis, um, last name E-N-N-I-S. Um, this is an event on the implications of um, journalism and the erosion of human rights um, around the world. And, um, oh, and I'm the president of the International Relations Council. Yeah. Eliza, from your perspective, why was it important to put today together? Yeah, I think in light of recent events, um, particularly in, in terms of Khashoggi um, in Saudi Arabia, um, but also thinking of the erosion of press freedoms in, in the United States, um, it's really important to be able to consider kind of the broader implication for human rights. And we're currently in an age in which people are thinking about new ways to protect journalists around the world. Um, and it's really important to make sure that the ideas around these coming from perspectives of ambassadors as well as people who are working with journalists on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that we can put those ideas together to be able to craft better solutions to protect journalists and press freedom in the future. Well, certainly what you brought up with Jamal Khashoggi, I mean, is an extreme example where someone was murdered as they were pursuing, well, in that case, for pursuing the truth, but just when he walked into that embassy, do you feel that the nations of the world, and particularly America, have provided enough of a response? I think that it's, it's um, it, whenever there's an erosion of press freedom, there, it demands an international response, but it also demands um, a, a response to focus on human rights. And so I do not think there has been enough of a response to the Khashoggi case, but I also think that there hasn't been enough um, protection overall in kind of a long-term trajectory looking at human rights um, as well as journalistic freedoms. Um, so again, I think that kind of all the nations of the world should come together and think about you know, what they've declared in the International Declaration of Human Rights and be able to put forth new methods um, to be able to protect journalists um, for years to come. Can you tell us what organizations have come together to bring this event to today? Yeah, um, so um, I represent the International Relations Council, um, which is a student organization at Harvard University um, focused on international education, both on campus and around the world. Um, but we also have um, representatives from the um, network of um, a North American um, but Bangladeshi um, journalists. Um, we also have uh, members from the United Nations, um, and we also have people um, from the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Carr Center for Human Rights. So the idea is to be able to have a kind of broad um, swath of people here to be able to give different perspectives on human rights, and we'll be able to ultimately work together um, in that. What's the feeling as you're talking to some of the people that you just mentioned really clearly in this, in this network from all around the world on what's happening in the United States right now with our own president and the White House, and what's seems to be his relentless attack on the First Amendment. Yeah, um, I think, so, you know, we'll see how, how the conversation unfolds today, um, but I think that seeing kind of these international issues coming to such an intense stage and then seeing that reflected in our own democracy is really concerning. And I think that, you know, many of the panelists today will be able to speak about their experiences with that, um, both, you know, kind of on an individual basis, but also what we've been seeing recently. Um, and I, I, I do some research also on women journalists in the United States and seeing kind of the erosion of protection for women journalists, um, both within individual um, journalistic networks, but also particularly within the White House press briefing room, um, is particularly concerning under this current administration. So is this one of your first events on this topic? And if so, um, what is your future plans on you know, encouraging this conversation going forward? Yeah, um, so the International Relations Council um, works on a broad variety of international issues. Um, so we've had some kind of discrete human rights events in the past, but we haven't focused particularly on journalistic freedoms. And I think that kind of as this conversation moves forth today, and also seeing how that impacts, we have a, a, a student publication on campus as well. So seeing how that impacts um, student journalists and journalists who will um, you know, kind of rise internationally um, I think it will be important to continue those conversations in the future, um, both by bringing you know, some of these speakers to have kind of smaller events with individual students, um, but also by continuing panel discussions. Welcome and good afternoon uh, to the distinguished panel here and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this seminar on implications of targeting media and journalists on human rights and democracy. Can you hear me in the background? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So this seminar is uh, jointly promoted by Harvard International Relations Council, which is called HIRC here at uh, Harvard College, and uh, Bangladesh Progressive Alliance of North America. We refer to it as BD Pana. Uh, 
the Harvard International Relations Council is a non-profit organization uh, and it focuses on a number of different outreach areas in an attempt to engage and inform people on international issues and policy making. Bidipana came about as a result of fellowship among a few like-minded Bangladeshi professionals uh, residing in North America, mostly in around Boston area, to promote meaningful dialogue on topics of nation building, industrial policy development, uh, discuss uh, cultural issues, economic growth in Bangladesh and South Asia in general. So um, today uh, we'll hear from this uh, distinguished uh, scholars and journalists uh, gathered here with a broad and deep background in diplomacy, foreign policy, nation building, human development, geopolitical conflict resolution, and among other relevant subject matters. We all agree that uh, free speech is vital for advancing and strengthening democracy. We have been observing media freedom and freedom of expression being constricted all over the world. The Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index 2017 put a special focus on state of media freedom around the world and the challenges facing freedom of speech. In that publication, not a single region recorded an improvement in its average score compared with 2016. According to that report, there is a growing evidence of disappointment with actually existing democracy. Larry Diamond, uh, he's a renounced uh, democracy scholar, as he put it, the world seems to be going through a democracy recession. Global press freedom has long been in decline and it seems to be getting worse. We all are painfully aware of the recent brutal killings of Washington Post correspondent, a Saudi Arabian journalist uh, called Jamal Khashoggi, or imprisonment of internationally acclaimed photojournalist Mr. Shahidul Islam uh, from Bangladesh, and imprisonment of uh, Reuters journalist Walong and uh, Kyoso O. Oh. I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce the last name, uh, from Myanmar. And not to mention constant sharp attacks on the media by the current administration in the USA. So today we hope to hear from our uh, panel members here uh, about their thoughts on these and other related issues and what they predict the future holds for us. Before I start, um, uh, so I'm going to just give an overview of the a journalist that we are featuring here today, but they're not the only one. We have hundreds of journalists around the world. They are some facing even worse um, uh, situation. Uh, before, um, there is a um, slogan in uh, Washington Post recently. It says, Democracy dies in darkness. And various autocratic and populist regimes developing our developed world target them. Precisely, they want to prevent us from getting the lights that these journalists and media provide us. And without those lights, we will be in the darkness. And democracy will be in grave situations. So our first featured journalist is Shohidil Alam from Bangladesh. He's an acclaimed photojournalist, a writer, a curator, and also a human rights activist. Um, so many people have not known him greatly around the world, but people who have known him, they have very high esteem of him. So one of them says, there is not a single documentary photographer in the Indian subcontinent who is untouched by Shahidu. He belongs to the world. He gave us the sky in which we learn to fly. That's coming from photographer Rani Sen of India. 
he has uh, created a short um, featured uh, movie. It's called My Journey as a Witness. To testament that the quality of the picture movie. Mushfiq uh, Bhai, he's blocking the. Uh, his book, My Journey as a Witness, has been described the most important book ever written by a photographer, said by John Morris, the former picture editor of Light Magazine. So he basically he, he he brought he has brought a new angle to this whole journalism and photojournalism. Uh, he's against the stereotype portrayals of for, by foreigners. He was against the stereotype portrayal of Bangladesh or third world in the Western media. He advocated lo local photographers telling the stories. So according to him, the West sole focus on poverty and disaster presents a damaging narrow view. For example, on Cyclone, Alam said, they wanted bodies, they wanted destruction. But what is also important was the fact that people were relying around to support each other. The farmers were replanting their seeds, that human beings were trying to rebuild their lives. Those stories are not really told as much as they should. Uh, he's a self-taught photographer, established uh, world-class photojournalism school in South Asia. After earning his PhD in chemistry from the UK, he switched to social documentary via photojournalism. He established Patshala, which is considered one of the finest school of photography in the world, which focuses on social documentary. Uh, so he established multiple world-class photo institutions. One is the gallery, another is Bangladesh Photographic Institution. His uh, Chobimela Photo Festival is regarded as the most demographically inclusive photo festival in the world. He also coined a phrase called majority world photo. So to anecdote this, uh, in 1993, Sholil Alam uh, was a little uh, uh, agitated uh, that, he, and he suggested that the World Press Photo, is one of the renowned organization, should change their name because lack of representation from the majority of the world, which is Asians, African, and Latin Americans. Three weeks later, the World Press Photo exhibition came to Bangladesh for the first time, and Alam became the first South Asian to chair that international jury of world photo press. And then in uh, 2004, he founded the International Photo Agency for photographers, uh, basically from Asia, Latin America, and Middle East, and appropriately called it Majority World Photo. He covered birth landscape, natural disaster, political upheavals, uh, deaths of government workers, struggles against human rights abuses, Bangladesh uh, autocratic government and military crackdowns on freedom of speech, enforced disappearance, judicial killings, and Rohingya refugees. So this is one of the pictures. He, when he first went back to Bangladesh from UK, he documented the uh, upheaval against the uh, military dictators. He went to Senegal, visited various African countries. This is one of the cultural things he highlights and he highlighted extrajudicial killing, Rohingya refugees, and he also, his work on Islamophobia and extremism, both, it's called Embracing the Other, was shown in the international acclaim at Baitul Rof Mosque. He achieved many awards, uh, it's too many to really note some of, uh, uh, his work has been in MoMA, New York, center of uh, George, Pompidou, Paris, Royal Arts Hall, and um, he spoke at uh, Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, Oxford, Cambridge. As you can see, I, can't, I don't want to really go through that. Uh, he voiced again government crackdown. On August 5 this year, Alom gave an interview to Al Jazeera and posted video in Facebook. 
criticizing government's uh, violent response to a peaceful <coughs> student protest. And subsequent to that, he was detained and for giving so-called provocative comments. And his bail has been denied uh, multiple times. He's charged under uh, controversial Section 56 law. Uh, if he's convicted, he faces up to 14 years in jail. He has. Uh, this is I, I want to uh, finish on him by one of his statement that says it's very important for me. That's what he said. What footprint I leave behind? I have tried in some ways to intervene so that the world that I live in is in some way different than the way I found it. Hopefully for the better. So the next journalist on a feature called Jamal Khashoggi, you probably all have known by now. Uh, he, was a power, he, he was from a very powerful and one long family in Saudi Arabia. He's actually grandson of uh, Muhammad Khashoggi, who was a personal physician of uh, Abdul Aziz, who founded Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, as, a, uh, as a career, he was a prominent journalist an editor uh, in Saudi Arabia, a started correspondent from Saudi Gazette, and as an assi assistant manager of OCAS, he reported very, uh, various weekly Arab newspapers and became editor-in-chief. Uh, later, um, he interviewed in his early career Osama bin Laden and covered Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, he served also as a senior advisor to the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, he became critical against the Saudi government and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's uh, repressive policies, called for wider freedom for expressions in the Arab world and women equals right. He believed and advocated for coexistence of secularism and Islam. He severely criticized Saudi war on uh, Yemen, blockade against Qatar, disputed uh, um, and against the dispute uh, against Canada. Uh, Saudi Lebanese policy and Egyptian uh, autocratic government. The Saudi royal family barred him from writing and blocked him in Twitter after that, uh, after he was critical of US President Donald Trump's Middle East policy, he fled to USA in self-imposed exile. He became a dissident col columnist in a, uh, in a series of Washington Post articles. Uh, he was missing after October 2, 2018, when he went to a Saudi consulate in Turkey, uh, the Saudi government admitted later killing him in a rendition fistfight after initially denying it in multiple versions. His body is alleged to have dismembered and yet to be found. Worldwide shocks and boycotts and condemnation followed. Our last featured journalists are a couple of journalists from Myanmar. They are the writer reporters. Uh, before writer, they have uh, worked in multiple uh, uh, local uh, newspapers. As writer journalist uh, uh, Wallon reported on controversial military land grabs of farmlands, the killing of ethnic minority in Northeast villages. Wallon also co founded a charity called uh, Third Story Project that teaches children on diversity and peace and tolerance. Kaya So U started. Uh, as contributing journalist for Rakhine Development News. Um, he joined Ryder in 2017 as an investigative journalist, primarily on Rohingya issues. Extensively reported on a series of military attacks on Rohingya minority. Led reports on Myanmar's plan to harvest and sell crops on Rohingya farmers, on segregation of Muslim farmers, etc. Their in the investigation of a mass grave in the village of Indin led the Myanmar military admitting killing of 10 Bengali terrorists and burying them in the mass grave. This investigation into the Rohingya mass massacre led United Nations to release a study on abuse in Rakhine, accusing Myanmar's military chief of heading a campaign of genocides and crime against humanity. They imposed media blackout in Rakhine. On December 12, Wallon and Koyesu were invited to a dinner with two police officers in a setup at a restaurant. They were arrested almost immediately. 
after they were given documents by an, an, an unidentified individual. Nine months later, their, uh, their arrest, they were sentenced to seven years <coughs> of imprisonment with hard labor under the colonial era official secret act for obtaining important secret papers. So this concludes my overview of the featured journalists. Please keep supporting voice. Thank you. There's a quote by Voltaire that many of you know, probably. It says, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I think that this has been attributed to Voltaire and discussion has been that the Voltaire did not say that himself, but a person who was writing about it is Evelyn Beatrice Hall. She sort of spoke for Voltaire that this is what Voltaire meant. Uh, in any case, this is, uh, this is something in this one sentence, I think uh, what we hear is what really is the, 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 really the element of democracy, element of free speech, element of debate, element of dialogue. And I think when that's lost, I think we lose everything. Because so when something becomes just one-sided, you know, sun has, sunlight has seven colors. That's what makes the sunlight. So when everything becomes one, unless the diversity is built into it, and diversity is expressed, so there's opinion, I think that it becomes meaningless. And it becomes meaningless only, it becomes meaningless, but it becomes powerful and ruthless, and it has to survive. And the problem is that when we also miss the point that good governance requires dialogue. Good governance requires debate. In, we can say that even among friends, when we talk, we don't have to necessarily even among friends, we don't have to agree with everything. But what makes us friends and what keeps us as friends is the fact that we listen to each other, we debate with each other, we learn from each other, and we grow stronger as friends. When that is lost, I think not only that something is very important is taken away from the society, but the government also loses. And I think that is essentially what is happening. So in my mind, what will happen is that this is what we have to recognize, that ultimately discussion debates will have to survive because, and not only survive, has to be nurtured for good governance, for the government to prevail. And that is my hope. Now, um, I have known Shahid al Alam for over 30 years. Actually, uh, every year when we go back to Bangladesh and we were there uh, this uh, uh, last summer, uh, in fact, right after Shahid al Alam was arrested, Renuma, his wife, and Saidia Gulruk from New Age, journal journalist from New Age, and Sarah Hussein, they came to our house to meet with my sister, younger sisters, Sultana Kamal, some of you may know. Uh, she's a human rights activist, and for her advice. And, and the discussion continued. They came other times. And I, I participated in some small ways with them, but at the same time, that relationship continues. And as I mentioned, that uh, I've known uh, Shadal for 30 years as a very close family friend. We have been involved with a number of projects, it's environment, art, literature, photography. Um, there's lots of uh, history uh, there. All along, what I've at least admired um, about him is that he will speak up and to speak up for himself as well as for others. And as we've said, that, uh, seen that he speaks with his camera, he speaks with his voice. And that is a treasure that we cannot really uh, uh, leave behind. Or we cannot go forward with such voices. And I know that it is, all, of course, about him. At the same time, it is about the other journalists who have been mentioned. It's about all journalists around the world that uh, are still trying to do the same thing and, and facing this. So to me, what can we do? I think about that. I think that we can do many things in our own ways, but two things that we can do 
is that when they are suppressed, repressed, we speak for them. Other thing is that we speak with them. And to me, speaking with them also means speaking on many different issues that are present. And it's not necessarily possible for all of us, but we can choose some and say something about how we, through our own voice, we're speaking with them. So I, it's a, in the short time, I would like to share a poem I wrote. And it's my way of addressing an issue that I think is been said, it will be said, and uh, anyway, when I read it, um, it will come through. Uh, the poem, name of poem is Buddha, <coughs> Buddha in your name. And I, I preface it with two lines. One is, all lives be happy, which is a word by Gautam Buddha. And another quotation, a textbook example of ethnic cleansing, which was sent by Zayed Rad al Hussein, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Buddha in your name. Buddha in your name, they commit genocide. Buddha in your name, they unleash ethnic cleansing. Rohingyas by name, children, women, men, young and elderly, able and disabled, healthy and sick, in hundreds of thousands, defying numbers are massacred, are maimed, are beaten, are raped, are persecuted, are terrorized in their homes. Their homes burn to ashes. They're driven out of their centuries old homeland. Buddha, in your name. The venomous monks preaching, quote, Buddhist purity, unquote, preach hatred. Inside violence, reward cruelty, cause suffering, commit murders. Buddha, in your name. Their orange robes are drenched in blood. The blood of the innocents, the blood of the helpless, the blood of the disenfranchised. The cowards, the hypocrites, the ambitious, the puppets, the moral degenerates, wearing the mask of liberators, wearing their mask of peacemakers, resort to silence facing the other way, closing their eyes while the atrocities continue and continue and continue. Buddha is your name. Oh Buddha, are you a mere statue sitting inert with your eyes closed? Are you a mere statue carved out of heartless stone? Are you a mere statue aloof and soulless meditating for enlightenment? Meditating for nirvana? Then how pathetic you look, oh Buddha. Where do you find enlightenment, Buddha? Where do you seek nirvana, Buddha? What path do you travel to see the light, Buddha? What path do you travel to attain Nirvana, Buddha? Nirvana is not there. Nirvana in the darkness is closed eyes, not in the darkness of denial, not in the darkness of indifference, not in the darkness of inaction, not in the heartless mass of stone. Open your eyes, Buddha. Open the eyes of all quote-unquote Buddhists in yoga pants and work clothes and monk robes and corporate suits seeking enlightenment, seeking nirvana. Open the eyes of all humanity across the world. Let the light of compassion, the light of justice, the light of conscience, the light of courage, the light of protest, the light of action, the light of peace spread across all humanity, across the universe in that and only in that, O Buddha, only that way, O Buddha, you will be the one with the light. Only that way, you shall attend Nirvana. Thank you. Oh.